uh, thank you for having me again, Techwell, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, in this webinar, I'm actually going to cover uh, a, and hopefully answer the question about how the intelligent tester can survive in the age of automation. A, a small teaser, you do survive at the end, it's a good ending. So you do survive uh, in the age of automation. And hopefully after this webinar, you'll understand also how. Uh, I am presenting on behalf of Testcraft, which is a, a Perforce company uh, responsible for scriptless Selenium, uh, allowing you to actually record robust uh, Selenium scripts without actually writing any lines of code. Uh, and at the end of this webinar, if you uh, survive, that's all about survival here, uh, I will show you a nice demo uh, of how you can actually get started with automation uh, with almost uh, near zero skill set. My name is Aran Kinsbrunner. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm Chief Evangelist and a Senior Director at Perforce, uh, working with Perfecto and Testcraft and few other products, uh, and also and available on uh, most social media, sometimes way too much. Uh, feel free, if you're not, not already following me, feel free to follow me and uh, share some of your experience, continue the discussion also after this webinar uh, with me, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, whatever. Uh, but yeah, during this webinar, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, feel free to ask the questions. We have a team here that is ready uh, to, to get the questions and uh, hopefully I will have time to answer most of them live during this webinar. So in today's webinar, I'm going to talk a bit about why are we actually talking about the survival and this is relating uh, to the state of software testing and where we are today with test automation, especially in the digital space, which is mobile and web. I'm also going to touch a bit about what we see from a modern pitfalls and challenges that we as testers uh, see day in and day out. And most important, I will talk a bit about the big opportunities that we as business testers uh, have in the era of modern testing giving you also some tips and best practices on how uh, business testers together with SDETs and developers can really work together towards the same goal of continuous testing. As mentioned, uh, Q&A throughout the webinar, and at the end, I will also uh, do a, sh a short but very cool demo of uh, a solution that can help you uh, do test automation in very uh, short amount of time. So what are the current pains that we as testers are seeing uh, on our daily basis as we are trying to automate web applications, mobile applications, or even desktop applications? So we are dealing with data overload, right? We see a growing number of test cases, whether they are manual or automated, that uh, we need to maintain, to manage, to uh, update, to create in a very short amount of time. The second is, how reliable are these test cases? Uh, I, I'm not using here the flakiness because I think people are tired of hearing the word flakiness, but uh, I would actually call this noise because at the end of the day, when you have a very short amount of time to do your test automation, uh, everything which is irrelevant, uh, unreliable, is being considered as noise. And noise is not just distracting you and taking time, but also, uh, reduces the level of uh, trust that testing has within the organization. We don't want to lose the trust uh, from our peers, developers, and by having a more reliable test artifacts, obviously we are getting the trust, we are ge uh, getting the seat in the table with all the PMs, POs, all the other uh, decision makers. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in today's reality, and it's not just because of the testers and their skill set, it's also about the complex digital assets that we need to automate and test every day, right? Responsive web, progressive webs, mobile uh, applications with multiple sensors, foldable smartphones. Um, these things obviously impact the level of test cases and the reliability uh, that we are uh, facing. The third one that, uh, in my mind, is a huge and constant pain that I've been seeing for the past two decades, I think, is the value, okay? And the value is not ROI. Uh, I'm trying to get away from the word ROI. 
what is the value that we can actually get from our testing? Because uh, you spend time in resources. In resources can be, by the way, computers, software, the people themselves, and the time that you are spending. The value needs to be mitigation of risk. Mitigation of risk also means uh, dealing with less less escape defects to production or to your final stages pre-production. So if you're not able to get the right value from your testing, which means proper test automation coverage, less noise, uh, less escape defects, high and happy uh, customers at the end of the day, you are not getting value from your testing. Obviously, the testing requirements and traceability, these tend to change day in and day out. And the test requirements can be a new window, a new feature, but also it can be a new object, OK? When you are dealing with React and other modern web applications, we know that elements tend to be dynamic and they change a lot. Uh, so dealing with the constant changes to the product requirements, to the test-related data that we are using uh, is obviously a huge pain that we as tester need to testers need to face. And last but not least is the data-driven decision making. At the end of the day, if you are running hundreds of test cases and you are blind to what they are producing from a value perspective, you cannot make the right decisions. So you need to have full quality visibility to all of your test cases, whether they are manual and exploratory, coming from Selenium, from WebDriver.io, from Cypress, any, any frameworks that you are using for test automation and test execution needs to produce data in a place that you can analyze and visualize so you can make data-driven decisions. Without that, OK, you are blind. And I tend to say, uh, as, as my kind of uh, statement, is that reporting and analytics is where you actually meet uh, your testing and actually see the value at the end of each execution. Because once you develop the test case, it's just in the pipeline. The only time that you are going to meet this test again is when it fails. And hopefully when it fails is when it finds a bug. If it fails because of noise, this is going back to the lack of value that we discussed earlier. So to our point about uh, becoming relevant, uh, especially with the intelligent tester, so what we are dealing in a modern squad feature team in the Agile era, we are dealing with three main personas. OK, up until I'm being challenged that there is a fourth persona that is in charge of testing. These are the three main uh, people that I deal with on a daily basis. And these are the business testers that are in charge of manual testing or exploratory testing. The SDETs, which are the test automation engineers in testing. These are the coders, the, the ones that are writing Selenium, Appium, Espresso, and other different uh, frameworks which are based on code. And obviously, the developers that are doing more testing than ever, the shift left strategy is a reality. It's not always perfect, but developers are doing much more than unit testing today. We see that by the, uh, them adopting frameworks such as Cypress on the web front. They're adopting Espresso and XUI test on the mobile front. Some are also looking at Flutter. But the balance or the lack of balance between these three different personas uh, this is, in my mind, the root cause of uh, the problems that we are facing, but also the opportunity uh, to collaborate and divide uh, the different load in test automation. If you can match the technologies to the persona and divide the different set of test cases, functional, non-functional, APIs, unit, etc., between the three different personas, obviously, based on these personas' objectives, you're going to be in a very good place. You will maximize your test automation coverage. You will get happier uh, practitioners because they are working on the right test cases. They are working in the right te technology stack. And obviously, they are producing value back to the business. So matching all of these is key for success. In this webinar, I'm mostly going to deal with the guys on the right bottom side of this slide, which are the business testers. These are the guys who are typically tasked with manual and exploratory testing. And I have nothing against manual testing or exploratory testing. I think these are very valuable test cases to have and to run. You cannot automate everything. 
but there are a lot of test cases that are being done manually because of skill set and not because of the objective behind them. So uh, in this webinar, I'm going to see and show you how you can leverage different technologies, different practices to really shift the, the business testers left in the pipeline so they can automate as well and join the developers and the SDETs in the workload in test automation. From a manual testing perspective, uh, what we are seeing today uh, done by the business testers mostly are the, these two types of testing, right? The structured testing, and this is where, you know, you have uh, either a Word document or a spreadsheet or whatever. Uh, some are using ALM tools, uh, and they're following step-by-step -step instructions, doing them manually, one step after the other. There are dependencies, there are environments that need to be set up for these manual test cases. But these are structured testing uh, that is being performed by the business testers. The other type, which I like much more, is the exploratory testing. The exploratory testing allows uh, the creativity of the business testers to really sporadically choose different areas and functionalities within the product and obviously challenge these uh, user journeys uh, in a very ad hoc fashion. And this is how you actually, in my experience, find the most critical bugs. And I will explain why. And this is the value that business testers actually brings to the business, okay? When you do the same test cases over and over again, whether they are manual in the structured manner or if they are regression test cases that are automated, you are mostly executing the same code one time after the other. When you're doing exploratory, you are, surprising the, the software if you like you're challenging the software in untraditional journeys okay you can start with functionality two and move to the functionality four move from one screen to the next interrupt with i don't know ad hoc events that are coming up and this is how you find new bugs new defects but what happens after you find these defects in the exploratory testing these are now old right they are no longer ad hoc test cases because you already ex executed them once and this is where in my mind if they are actually uh, of value where these exploratory test cases needs to be automated shifted into a structure testing and being pulled left into the regression suite okay but this is where the reality today is these manual test cases are keep being executed the exploratory testing uh, is done Sometimes it finds a bug, it, it's being fixed and validated, but that's it. We are no longer um, re-leveraging and utilizing exploratory testing from an automated standpoint. And this is where business testers, if they had the opportunity to properly automate exploratory testing that brings value, they could have shifted them left, expand the test coverage, and also identify more defects in the pipeline going forward. But right now, the reality in many organizations that I'm dealing with is that both the structured and the exploratory testing are still in the manual uh, scope and they are not uh, being automated by anyone. So what are the, what are the benefits, if you like, and the, uh, the good and the ugly uh, of uh, manual and exploratory testing? So from an exploratory testing perspective, uh, obviously, uh, doing manual exploratory testing is ad hoc. You're always innovating. You're very creative. There is a very good chan chance or chances that you will find new bugs by doing exploratory testing. You are thinking like the end users, okay? You are, uh, as an exploratory testing, if you are not as familiar with a, the with a product, you're going to become much more familiar than other test automation engineers because they are not really exercising all the different aspects of the product. They're usually focused on very niche areas of their, uh, you know, responsibility. Uh, and while it's not 100% structured, you, this is where you get the quick wins. Obviously, and from my own personal experience, whenever I'm doing exploratory testing and finding a bug, it's not just it's fast, but I'm getting a lot of excitement from the developers because while I'm giving them this uh, high priority bug that I found through exploratory testing that no one uh, would have think, thought about, uh, a lot of regression testing uh, is being uh, executed and not always really finding anything. So 
exploratory testing at the end of the day is something that we want to have and this is very good it's a good practice uh, but it needs to be managed okay well these are ad hoc test cases that need to be managed and you need to have kind of a follow-up after good sessions of exploratory testing by shifting them left if you can automate them uh, again if they were producing value uh, from a business tester perspective, this is the ugly side. Even if he liked what he found uh, from an exploratory and manual testing perspective, he cannot easily automate that because he's not a test developer. He cannot write code or he's not as good as an SDET to write code. So this is not an easy way for him to move from an exploratory manual testing to a pipeline automated one. Next. It takes too long because it's usually the exploratory and manual test cases are not structured, are not part of the cycle, are not part of the build acceptance testing, for, for example. So sometimes this feedback comes way too late and too long in the process, and sometimes they might even cause slipping uh, to production. Uh, obviously, there can be also errors because you are doing it manually things cannot uh, always be in the right context. So manual testing by definition is error prone. Um, keeping up with new features, again, if you're not part of the cycle, part of the party, if you like, of automation and being in the sprint, sometimes as a manual tester, you are kept out of the loop and you're not always aware of new features, new functionalities. So this is something that, uh, again, Kind of an ugly side of uh, being in the business or manual testing uh, side of the house. Uh, as a manual tester and business uh, or exploratory tester, you are not always getting access like the developers to the latest and greatest environments, and this often blocks you from being uh, from uh, running advanced test scenarios. So this is sometimes a limitation, especially when you are dealing with modern and uh, advanced technologies. Um, and the, the maintenance of these test cases is always, uh, it's not version, it's not code. So uh, obviously manual and exploratory testing are always out there and they are not governed. And that's another pain that we need to uh, consider and resolve. Um, I, I think I mentioned a bit about the defect and feedback loop that is uh, not as efficient. And all of these uh, pass fail uh, criteria for manual and uh, <clears throat> exploratory testing are not tied into product requirements. By definition, an exploratory test is an ad hoc. So you can uh, report it as a bug, but your product managers, and I know from my own experience, would come to you and say, okay, this was never kind of uh, a definition. Uh, there is no JIRA for that. Uh, so you're coming with a very good maybe bug, but it was not a requirement. So uh, by not having these test cases structured, sometimes you're going to get into some uh, battle with your developers because you're giving them bugs that might not be uh, well defined. Okay. Uh, skill set, we'll touch on that very soon. And uh, I think that's also something that uh, needs to be kept uh, in consideration when you're doing manual and exploratory testing. These are shorter test scenarios. Uh, it makes no sense to do longer flows for uh, exploratory testing. You want the fast feedback, you want to uh, cover a specific capability rather than doing a very long end-to-end -end testing. So it can be both, by the way, good and bad in that, in that regard. Um, moving to the, uh, you know, taking actually everything that I said in the previous slide and putting it into the context of test automation coverage, uh, this is a nice illustration. I'm using it a lot, uh, done by Michael Bolton and Ingo Philip, who actually reiterated what Michael was uh, saying about the ocean of test cases, right? You have so many test scenarios, but what do you automate and how you maintain this automation? This is the art. This is what uh, challenges most developers, SDETs, and business testers. Because again, once you executed, you created the test scenarios and you are running them, they are no longer news, right? These are becoming regression suite. And this is what you are running, and this is what's on top of the ocean, right? You're uh, kind of assessing and uh, validating risks that you know about by running tests that you also know about. But what you're not exploring is the things that you either performed in the past 
that you are no longer running, exploratory testing that are not, again, uh, always part of this cycle, okay, and some risks that you are not uh, imagining. So the point of this slide, and it relates strongly to the previous one of manual and exploratory testing, is that this is where you can actually uh, expand the coverage and identify more risks and uh, come up with more test cases by putting all these manual and exploratory testing that are under the water in most cases today and put them on top of the water by shifting them left through easy automation. And that's the way business testers can survive by really taking into consideration uh, easier tools for test creation, putting their brains, their product knowledge uh, that allow them actually to create this great manual and exploratory testing and automate them, uh, again, putting them into the CI CD pipeline. That's their biggest value. And by the way, if they're good at that, they will become much more relevant in the process than the SDETs. Okay? That's my understanding and that's my belief. So, Take this under consideration when you think about the exploratory testing, which usually covers much more than the scope of what you are automating today. With that in mind, let's move to the opportunities and what business testers can accomplish today with existing technologies to not just stay relevant, but also maybe become more relevant than other tester, testers like the developers and the SDETs. So, the first one, the first opportunity isn't new. I'm not, you know, uncovering anything that you haven't not uh, heard about. Uh, and this is the BDD, the Three Amigos, Behavior Driven Development, and how you can, you know, tie and connect the, the business testers, uh, the developers, and the business into a single process or practice to create test automation that actually works and identifies or um, covers the actual user stories for the products. It's less guessing and more focused testing by the entire organization. In a BDD process, you know, customer will give you the uh, business requirements, the, the feature request. It will be translated into a JIRA uh, ticket or feature, user story or an epic if it's a bigger feature. From that, it will be translated by the business testers you guys online uh, into behavior-driven scenarios written in Gherkin or you know the BDD language. Uh, it will require developers and SDETs to support by creating step definition. Okay, this is Selenium, Appium, and other Java-based uh, methods that will be used or utilized by the Gherkin scenarios. But at the end of the day, you are executing end-to-end -end user acceptance testing that is very tied to the stories coming from the customers, and you are fully aligned with both the developers and the business testers and the SDETs, okay? There is no longer, when you're implementing BDD, no one can really blame each other because it was kind of a, a collaboration effort between the three amigos as uh, uh, displayed on the slide to come up with the end goal of test automation. Uh, again, there is a dependency here when you are doing BDD uh, on developers, okay? Business testers and uh, manual testers, the different names to this persona, can create very easy data-driven testing with scenarios and examples, as you can see on that slide, writing them in plain English in Gherkin. Uh, uh, in Perfecto, we have developed an open source framework that is called Quantum. Quantum allows you to create BDD scenarios in Gherkin with underlying functions in Java or JavaScript uh, based on Selenium and Appium, whether it's web or mobile focused applications. But for succeeding in that, you really need to, to rely on a good uh, developer or an SDET that will develop for you these step definitions in Java. So, uh, for example, on this slide, you see, given I am on Google search page, this is a method in Java, okay, in Selenium, and the business testers will need to ask for these methods to be created so they can move on with their test creation. But still, this is a very uh, relevant opportunity for business testers to not just stay relevant, but also create test automation. They only need this 
uh, re recurring reusable methods uh, so they can create multiple scenarios and exploratory testing as well. BDD is very good at manual and exploratory testing automation because it's, you know, all coming from the end user perspective. Given a user is doing something and something else is happening, when I'm doing that, I'm going to expect that, right? So it's kind of an end user uh, perspective testing uh, in plain English that uh, business testers can do. So that's the, the obvious and currently uh, one of the leading options in the market for business testers to join the automation journey. Um, and this is, by the way, when you are running uh, BDD scenarios, uh, if you're using Quantum, this is how it's going to look like uh, on, on the Perfecto product. Uh, from a behavior-driven pers perspective, you see all the different given when then, and you will see the videos and the screenshot uh, in the reporting portal. So one opportunity, as mentioned, is adopting behavior-driven development. If you are a manual tester and you haven't still uh, experience BDD, this is a good opportunity for you to do it right now. Before I move to the next opportunities, we have a poll uh, that is coming up soon, so I'm going to click on that, and hopefully you guys online should be able to see a poll happening uh, or, uh, in your screen, on your screen, and it's asking you how do you feel about AI's growing role in manual testing, okay? And uh, this is a nice segue to my next uh, my next uh, section of this presentation, uh, but uh, I see that there is a strong battle between uh, the guys that are liking AI in manual testing and few that haven't thought about it yet. Uh, I would give the audience just a short amount of time to, con to conclude this uh, poll or the survey uh, because it's actually getting more interesting. Okay, if I continue talking, it's going to be a, a whole different. Uh, Responses, I like it. Um, okay, so thank you guys online for uh, participating. I will stop the poll right now and see if I can share with you the results. Um, here they are. So about 40% uh, actually uh, haven't thought yet about how AI can help them in manual testing. Uh, the other half, I would say, uh, said that it's great using AI in manual testing. I will soon explain what actually AI with manual testing means. And uh, I would say 20% uh, said that it's con it concerns, concerns them uh, to think about AI growing role in manual testing. So let me uh, give you my take on um, AI with manual testing. Manual testers, as I mentioned earlier, have a great opportunity they know the product, they can automate, they can uh, run as many manual testing as they like, and they can create exploratory ad hoc testing. The only thing that they cannot do is fit all of these manual test cases inside the sprint, in the cycle, in an automated fashion. And in today's reality with CI and CD, these test cases often are being lower in priority, they are neglected and kept outside of the cycle. AI that can automate, augment your end user uh, experience and test cases and pull them into the cycle gives you guys, the business testers, an opportunity to be part of the cycle. Otherwise, as the, the modern DevOps uh, grows, and by the way, AI and uh, machine learning, and I know a bit about it because I just finished writing a book about AI and machine learning in DevOps, uh, it's not just in testing. Okay, so we cannot really, uh, even if it concerns us and if we don't feel right about it, AI machine learning is here. It's in almost every phase of the DevOps pipeline from test, uh, from code creation to code reviewing, observability, uh, logging, production monitoring, and many more. So it just makes sense that we'll use and uh, leverage AI machine learning also in test creation and test automation. So. I think that that's the future, and I think the business testers and the exploratory uh, testers are the first in my mind to benefit from AI uh, as part of the intelligence testing uh, uh, wave that we are now experiencing. So this leads us, as you see on the slide, to the next opportunity. The first one is BDD. BDD is solid, it's out there, but 
the negative or I, w I won't be negative. So I said the the less uh, easy part of BDD from a business tester perspective is the dependency on developers. You cannot do BDD in Gherkin without having the step definition provided to you in Java, JavaScript, or other languages. Okay, so this will this is actually creating an ongoing dependent dependency uh, on the business testers to get this support and maintenance from the SDETs. Okay, when you are uh, looking at the codeless and scriptless testing, intelligent testing that is driven by AI and machine learning, this is an independent domain. It allows the business testers to be in a, his own silo, not in the negative context, his own silo from lack of dependencies. He knows what he needs to test. He has all the manual test cases in mind or exploratory testers, test cases, and is just going to use this tool to create the automation and most of the, the codeless and intelligent testing uh, that I know of, including test craft that we are featuring in this webinar, are fully connected to the pipeline. So uh, you're not really, while I mentioned the word silo, it's a silo from a test creation perspective with low, with low dependencies on developers, but it's easily and fully integrated into the pipeline. So you can create in your own time uh, test automation, which is high quality. It's driven by AI, but you can shift it left through Jenkins and other CI tools and be part of the same uh, cycle as the regression suites written by uh, developers and assets in Selenium and other frameworks. Okay. And uh, just to uh, say a few words about uh, um, these boxes or these uh, uh, messages on this slide. Uh, I mentioned the increased test automation coverage by using intelligent and cordless test, test creation tools. The maintenance is something that you are going to benefit from. And this is not something that code uh, based frameworks like Selenium are providing you, right? When you are writing code in Selenium, you need to always maintain the code. You need to make sure that you're using the right XPath and the CSS and the element locators. And you need to make sure that uh, there is synchronizations between the UI and timelines and stuff like that, okay? And it's code. So code needs to be maintained in a version control and stuff like that. Second, uh, it's all about uh, the creation of test automation. When you are writing a, a Selenium script in Java or JavaScript or other language binding, it takes you a few hours, okay? Because you need to create it, write it in code. You need to debug it. You need to run it across multiple browsers. It takes hours. When you're using intelligent test cases, uh, test creation tools, you are able to almost record the test in a very reliable way. And it takes you, you know, few minutes to do it. And I will prove it to you at the end of this webinar. But most important is that, again, this is a complementary uh, test automation creation solution to the code related testing. Okay. This is not coming to take any, any other job away from the SDETs and the developers. It's just coming to complement from a test automation coverage perspective and actually shift more testing left to the cycle. And this is where you see here the complement code based testing. Both the BDD and the intelligent codeless testing tools are complementing other uh, testing that is happening, which is fully code based. Okay, it's not coming to replace them. And the balance would vary between the objectives and the skills that you have in the organization. If you have more business testers, obviously, you might look at more coverage coming from the intelligent testing frameworks rather than the code-related frameworks and vice versa. OK, so that's an important message. The next two slides I wanted to compare, and I'm putting here uh, the logo of Selenium. There is nothing wrong with Selenium. I love Selenium, Perfecto, Testcraft. Everyone loves Selenium. It's the leading uh, framework for cross-browser testing. I'm just giving it here, this logo, as uh, an example of a code-based framework. And I want to show you the differences, because uh, all of this webinar is about the opportunities for an intelligent business tester to uh, really adopt test automation solutions, such as uh, Testcraft. And how is going to do it? It's going to do it by understanding the differences. Okay, we don't want to have any duplicates between these two different methods and tools. 
On the left, you have the, the assets and the developers, and they're going to continue writing their test automation in Java and other bindings. On the right hand, you have the codeless uh, business testers that are going to create the test using uh, a recording tool or a codeless tool uh, that comes to complement the left side of this screen. But you need to understand that the test authoring is totally different, right? This is code, and code is managed in version controls. On the right hand, you are using a, a standalone, while it's SaaS, but it's a standalone creation solution. You're not writing a, one line of code. If you want, you can, but that's not the, the, the main part of creation. The main part of the creation is using a UI tool, uh, web-based, to generate test automation scenarios. Okay, obviously it's going to be much faster to create test cases from uh, a codeless perspective than writing them in Java. Okay, but, but then the skill set also will be different. To create a test case in Selenium, you would need a developer who is familiar with uh, front end and back end services. On the right hand, you just need uh, the business tester who can work uh, with the UI and get up to speed quite fast. Maintenance is one of the most painful things in test automation, and everyone online who has written a few test automation scenarios in Selenium or Appium or other frameworks would agree with me that keeping these test cases running one time after the other is a huge challenge, a huge pain. And uh, when you're dealing with codeless tools that comes usually with a self-healing mechanism, you let the, the engine, the AI thing that some of you were afraid of in the poll that we just conclude, concluded, you let the AI deal with the self feeling so you don't need to. Okay? So this is uh, uh, something that is very important. The key differences between the test automation creation and the maintenance of the script between a code based and a codeless. Okay? This is important to understand. The other things that are different in this regard are the way that you are executing uh, the test cases. In most cases, when you're executing, uh, code related stuff, you need to set up a Maven and a test and G data provider and stuff like that. Uh, again, requiring you to do some coding, setting up your grids and everything like that. When you're running with codeless, the execution engine is built into the UI. You can schedule it via CI. You don't need to even uh, know anything about Jenkins. It's plugged in. You just need to copy paste the command line and it's connected to your CI. Okay, it's much easier to execute the test cases from a codeless tool than with code. And again, that's not a battle between one and, and the other. Keep, keep in mind, one should complement the other, but you need to understand that there are differences in the flow, in the process from end to end, from the creation, through the execution, and also from the analysis perspective. One thing that we, we cannot take away from the code-based solutions is their maturity. The maturity of Selenium and the likes is higher than Codeless because Selenium was here for almost 15 or even more years now. And there are best practices, there are a lot of documentations and code samples, and there is a huge community behind that. This is not something that uh, you can compare with a Codeless tool. Codeless tools, uh, you don't need code samples, right? It's just how you uh, get started with creating the test cases, how you merge them in the CI. So it's a different level of practices that are being actually built right now. Uh, I'm actually taking an active part myself in building good working practices of using codeless in conjunction with code base in a single CI CD pipeline. Okay. Last but not least is what you can actually accomplish with this, each and every tool. And this is where the complementary uh, benefit comes into play. When you're dealing with code base, you can do much more test cases. You can do APIs and you can do functional and non-functional and accessibility and stuff like that. Most codeless tools that are out there are good and they can do a lot of test cases, mostly functional and APIs, but they are not good yet. Yet, I'm saying they will evolve uh, in doing, for example, accessibility and non-functional uh, non performance testing. This is actually the proof that you need that one can complement the other and one can support the other based on objectives, skill set, and the timeline that you have. The bottom line here is you need both. And this is the opportunity for a business tester to shine and to work together 
with the developers and the assets toward a single goal. And this is a showing high quality, a showing high coverage, reducing the time for test maintenance throughout the entire maturity of your product. With that, I'd like to jump to uh, an introduction of the Testcraft uh, Intelligent Codeless Solution. And this is how the uh, Testcraft architecture is being built, okay? You don't need to install anything. It's fully web-based, it's SaaS. You can do it uh, and record your test cases from any browser, okay? You don't need to even install a plugin like some of uh, the, the competitors requires you. So it's very easy, it's SaaS-based, it's cloud, and you can get up and running very fast. Uh, it's fully supporting the Selenium, and this is the most important thing here, because we want to complement the assets and the developers. So Testcraft was built on top of Selenium. It has a pure Selenium implementation underneath, so almost any function uh, that you want to uh, automate, is supported, and I will so soon show you a demo. It's fully supported by the Testcraft solution. So you actually are not duplicating or creating something that you are not familiar with. You're just leveraging the Selenium underneath with an overlay of UI codeless framework to allow you to automate uh, your end-to-end -end scenarios. Second, you are also getting, and this is not something that is easy to get with Selenium, you're getting a full-blown framework. Okay, test framework comes with different layers, right? Test framework needs to have the creation layer. It needs to have the object, uh, the object spy. It needs to have the execution layer, the scheduling and orchestration, and the reporting. With Testcraft, you get all of these layers in a single implementation because you get obviously the creation of the test cases by a record and playback mechanism. You have the smart AI object locator. It's fully compliant with Selenium. You can orchestrate and run the test cases within Jenkins and other built-in schedulers and enjoy the full blown report at the end of the execution across different browsers. So it's kind of an all-in-one. Uh, when, I, when I talk about AI object uh, locator, this is what I actually uh, talk about. And that's the maintenance piece that you are uh, enjoying here. And in the demo, you will see it even more in details. It might be a bit blurry uh, in the screenshot. But the AI engine behind Testcraft simply scans the entire DOM tree behind your web application. And if something changed, if an element locator is being uh, modified or moved or whatever, the engine in real time can assess and provide uh, the execution layer the right element to use. So you are always going to run the test kind of in a self-healing method. And this is the, the AI engine behind Testcraft. And it means a lot. Think about running uh, a Selenium script in Java with the wrong element locator across, I don't know, 10 different browsers. You will find out that you got an exception or something in the report. And then you need to start debugging. You need to use an object spy or an inspector to understand what went wrong. Here, the AI engine and the tool do it, does it for you automatically. You don't even need to know which object is being uh, used behind each and every button that you click on. This is done for you automatically. Obviously, you can connect Testcraft with Perfecto if you want to scale and automate on more browsers than uh, you, you need to or want to, just to reduce the, the, the uh, execution time and also cover more uh, permutations. So Testcraft is obviously uh, connected uh, with Perfecto if needed and you can uh, scale and run uh, in the cloud uh, on many different versions. Um, what you also get, and it's also something in my mind very, very important, it's all about the life cycle of a test. You create a test, you want to either leverage and duplicate or clone it to utilize it across other test scenarios. You want to manage the test cases in versions. You want to uh, create a suite, you get the full aspect of test management with Testcraft by allowing you to create projects. Projects can include suites and test scenarios. You get the full granularity of a testing lifecycle in a single tool, and it's web-based, it's modern, and it's easy for you to clone and reuse across multiple projects that you have within the team. So this is also a great advantage. 
Last but not least is the debugging aspect of TestCraft, and this is how you can uh, run the test, get all the logs, the reports, the screenshots, and understand what's going on so you can report and, again, be part of the cycle, but also provide the actionable insights when something goes wrong. And this is what also TestCraft can provide you. Let me show you uh, a short demo right now. And uh, I decided in my demo uh, to try and surprise. Uh, let me see that I can do it. Can you see my browser, just to make sure that I'm showing you the right screen? Sarah, or anyone on the uh, tech website? I'm coming. Or? Yeah, I do. I see a test craft um, browser window with three windows, trial, project name, tech, tech webinar. Good. Excellent. Right so I'm, I'm showing you okay. the, right, the right thing. And what I've created, and I'm going to enhance it live with you guys, I created a TechWare webinar project in TestCraft. OK, you see the date. It's fresh. And I've done an exploratory scenario here. OK, exploratory because we're dealing with business testers who try to become more intelligent. And I'm just going to run the test that I created. It took me five minutes to create it. I'm going to use the TechWare.com. Uh, as my environment, I'm going to use a Chrome browser with this screen resolu resolution. I could have also used uh, a data file. So if I need to do a data-driven testing, I could have done it as well here. I'm not going to use uh, a data-driven uh, file for this execution. But what I'm going to do, I'm adding a breakpoint at the end of the test. So the test will not end after the last step. It will allow me to do more things afterwards. So I'm going to click on Run. What's going to happen right now, a new virtual machine, a new browser is going to be uh, created for me with the Chrome, uh, Chrome browser on this screen resolution. It's going to go to the TechWell uh, web, and it's going to look at Star East. You see how fast it's running. It's going to go to the speakers list. By the way, I'm also attending Star East and speaking at this event. And I'm going to stop at the registration page. Uh, and by the way, at each and every step of the way, I have put some validation points. OK, now the test was completed. It took, I don't know, 15 seconds or so to run, 38 seconds. OK, but you see here, these are checkpoints. I was checking the element text upon each transition from one screen to the next to make sure that I am on the right page. So if there is something wrong, I can easily debug and know what happened. Uh, I'm doing text and element validations. And now, before I click, I can close the test and get done with that and get the report. But I don't want to do it. I want to add one more step. So what I can do here, I can click on Summary. What you can see here, because I'm using Selenium, each and every uh, method or option that Selenium exposes or the button the element is exposing, I have the option to interact with it. I can click on it. I can do a text validation or a visual validation. And I can also do a mouse hover if I, can, if I want to find uh, a text that might be, from an accessibility standpoint, behind this button. I will click on uh, this, OK, on the summary. And you see here that a new step was added, clicking on summary, OK? I can now do another validation. I can click on re register now. Every button that is on the screen is accessible to TestCraft. And I can do another step. I can add another step in between here. I will stop the execution because, you, because I think you got the point. OK? I can uh, look at the summary. This, is, this was the test case. And I see that it passed. It didn't find anything for me. I can look at the canvas. This is my playground, if you like. And you see here the full scenario, end to end, with all the steps, the validations, the navigation. I can click on a specific object here. OK? And when I click on Advanced Element Settings, you can see what I was talking about, the AI element locator. This is the entire set of attributes this, that this object is exposing to the user, to the tester. And you can see here that this is uh, the inner text. This is the uh, in my mind, this is the highest uh, value from a percentage or weight perspective that the engine found. It means that 
uh, when clicking on the object, the engine or the execution layer of the TestCraft solution, this is the object that is going to be used. If it was this object, obviously, uh, or if in the next run there will be an, a shift from an object locators or this object disappeared and there is a different object which has a higher scale or higher priority, the engine will automatically transition to the next object. Okay, and by the way, I can also as a user override this selection and I can choose a different object if I like. So this is how uh, a very easy to create test scenario in TestCraft looks like, right? You see all the flow, you see the, the validations, the conditions, I can add and edit more. You see here all the different options. Everything that can be done here could be done also with Selenium, but it's now uh, available to be uh, created without writing any line of code. Another thing that you can do here is uh, uh, the executions, okay? You can see here the uh, full set of executions that I have. This is very, uh, very useful. And let me go back to the specs, to this one. And I just want to see if I can uh, show you something else. Uh, OK. Uh, from a, an asset perspective, you can choose different locations. You can set environments. You can uh, choose the different platforms. If I, uh, I want to add another platform, instead of Chrome, I want to add uh, a different browser like uh, I don't know, Firefox with this screen resolution, I can add it. And once I am uh, running the test again, I can choose either both or just the new platform that was just added. I can also schedule the test to run from Jenkins uh, and other command line options uh, at a given date. So it comes with a full blown scheduler for me to uh, run it within CI and CD. So you are getting the point here. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen now because I, I just want to leave time for uh, the final slide and Q&A. Uh, but what I was able uh, to show you here is uh, a codeless solution. I also talked a bit about BDD earlier, but a codeless solution fully based on Selenium that allows you to create. And good news for TechWell, no bugs were found. The website is very good. Uh, you can register to Star East if you like as well. Uh, and we are a sponsor as well. Perfecto is sponsoring, uh, Perforce is sponsoring uh, Starist as well. And the website is up and running. So this is good news. Um, and uh, I just want to conclude this webinar with just a few tips for staying relevant. As a business tester, the technology is continuously growing and advancing AI, machine learning, cordless technologies, new frameworks, open source or commercial you need to continuously be on the lookout for alternatives. Continuously doing manual testing and exploratory testing will not be the solution, especially in the Agile and DevOps reality. So whether you choose to go in the codeless direction or the BDD, it's fine, but you can no longer run hundreds and dozens of uh, manual test cases per each build. It will just slow you down and might make you irrelevant as technology advances. With that in mind, you need to sharpen your skill set. While you're a manual tester and you're good at that, uh, exploring new technologies is good, but also learning uh, and making sure that you are becoming better in doing this kind of test cases on more advanced uh, application types like microservices, API testings. These are not that complicated to understand. You need to be also uh, mindful about your skill set and you need to sharpen it as you move forward, OK? Adopting technology obviously uh, ties back to everything that I just said. Uh, but you need to adopt technology that really fits into your process and your CI CD pipeline. Not any technology would do it. So you need, after you explore the alternatives, you need to validate it that it really fits the practices and the processes that are being used in your organization. Uh, from If you had adopted BDD or Codeless, it's not a, a bulletproof, even though I might have convinced you that uh, the cordless solution produces great results. It does, but it needs help. Every now and then, you need to validate and maintain your scripts just because things happen, the product changes, the flows are changing, and the product the, and the cordless tools that you are using are also changing. So you need to put some milestones in uh, between each and every iteration just to make sure, like you're doing with Selenium and Appium, right? 
you need to exercise these test cases uh, you know, uh, offline to make sure that they are ready for prime time when they are being launched from CI. And if you are successful in all of these steps, expanding and doing more with these tools, obviously expanding the test coverage, pulling more historical test cases that were proven to be good exploratory testing is a very, is a very good suggestion. With that, I think we have one last poll to ask you guys. With that, we'll then move to the Q&A. So do you think no-code automation tools could enhance testing at your organization? That's a great question. And let's see uh, if, if I was able to convince you or not. Thank you for everyone that uh, participates in uh, the previous poll and this one and being active as well. I really appreciate that. Um, and I think that we are seeing here that the majority of uh, responders do believe that uh, no code automation tools can enhance their testing activities, whether it's web, mobile, or both. So I really appreciate your response. And with that, uh, I would like, before I move to the Q&A, to thank you guys for being with us and joining this webinar. Thank you, Techwell, for organizing and uh, hosting this webinar on our behalf. And uh, let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, um, we do have some questions. Um, first, uh, there was a question about the book that you had mentioned, um, Accelerating Software. So I just want to reiterate that title. Uh, you... I, I, surprisingly, I have it with me. Uh, oh, OK. Not, yeah, uh, so Accelerating Software Quality in the Age of uh, DevOps with AI and Machine Learning. Um, it was launched last September. It's available on Amazon in both uh, ebook, Kindle edition, and paper. Um, I'm not uh, saying anything on my behalf. It was chosen as one of the best uh, AI machine learning books uh, and best selling books on Amazon. So I hope that it does bring value. It does cover a few of the things that I mentioned in this webinar as well. So if you think that it can help you learn a bit more about the technologies around AI and machine learning, not just for testing, by the way, in the entire DevOps pipeline, go check it out. All right. Um, we have a question from Teresa. What are the steps to take to go from all manual testing to AI machine learning testing? That's a great question. And like anything in life, you want to do it carefully and start small. Start small means, OK, the fact that you have so many test cases that are manual doesn't mean, again, even if they were automated, that all of them are very important and of value. You want to uh, classify them or slice and dice them uh, based on categories and functional areas and see that you can start with a small proof of concept of, let's say, 10% or 5% even of these test cases, pull them into a cordless tool uh, and see that they work, see that you're feeling comfortable automating, you know, 5, 10, 20 test cases. Once they're automated, not don't just run away and uh, add more test cases. Start by exp uh, expanding them, running them across multiple platforms. We're talking here about web. See that these scripts are very uh, stable and reliable when they're running on Safari and on uh, Chrome and Edge and IE, whatever. Then pull them into the CI CD. Make sure that they are running well from Jenkins. They are not causing any conflicts with the other test cases that are not AI machine learning driven. Only then expand your coverage. So that would be my kind of maturity model for you. Start small, make sure that they are reliable, expand the coverage, pull them into the CI, and then do the same for the next bucket, and then build one, one on top of the other. All right, we are at the top of the hour. Um, we'll do one more question um, from Richard. Is there any way to integrate test crest test with Jenkins triggering them? Sure, it's built into the product. So uh, Testcraft has a full integration with Jenkins. We have customers uh, using Testcraft with Jenkins and other, by the way, other CI CD tools. We have documentation online and uh, we can actually uh, show you a demo of how it's done. Uh, you cannot also uh, schedule them on specific dates and times 
without Jenkins as well. So you can do both. You can integrate them into Jenkins or you can schedule them, running them offline, let's say each and every Monday and Wednesday at 2 a.m., whatever. So uh, you can play and uh, do whatever you like from a scheduling perspective within CI and outside of CI. Okay, um, we do have a lot more questions that came in. I apologize that we didn't have time to get all of those. Uh, we will provide all your questions to Iran and he can follow up. Um, Iran, you wanna give your uh, contact info one more time before we close out? Does they wanna follow uh, up with you directly? I don't know if it's on the slide here, uh, but uh, I think if you just search for my name, Iran Kinsbunner on Google, you will find <laughs> almost every, Unfortunately, I think you also <laughs> might have my phone number. So uh, just search me up on Google. I'm on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, everywhere. Very good. Well, that ends our event for today. I'd like to thank Iran for his time and Test Craft by Perforce for sponsoring this web seminar. And also a special thank you to our audience for spending the last hour with us. We hope to see you at a future event. Thank you. Thank you.